Welcome to the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability Podcast. Today we are visiting with Trammell S. Crow. Hey Trammell. Hello. Good to see you. Thanks Good for to visiting see you. with us. Since last night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is a very special episode because we're also joined by Joni Clark, who's one of our premier ambassadors at the Why on Earth community and who's also on our global advisory board. So Joni, so glad you could be here with us also. Well, thrilling and exciting, especially to be here in Dallas with you, Trammell, and all you do. I'm so, I've been waiting to do this. And thank you for coming in last night for the half Earth Day that we had, April 22 being Earth Day, October 22 being half Earth Day, and we had 500 people. It was a fabulous celebration. And another million in the sidelines waiting. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. <laughs> Uh, another million Once they centers. get an invitation, they'll be yeah. here too. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we got we got a lot to talk about, and I'm really excited. And before we before we dive in, let me just share with our audience a little about you and your background, Trammell. So, Trammell S. Crow is Dallas, Texas-based businessman, philanthropist, entrepreneur, and innovative leader in business development and operations. He is the founder of Earth Day Texas, the world's largest Earth Day celebration which in 2011 transformed into Earth X, the world's largest environmental expo, conference, and film festival, which takes place every April in Dallas, Texas. Just keep saying large, world's largest. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> Texas thing, right? All right. And just, just to give you an idea, in 2019, just this, this past year, uh, the Earth X had over 177,000 attendees, 650 exhibitors, each of those representing often multiple organizations, 6,500 youth, 452 Yay. speakers, and uh, was a an amalgam of nine different conferences going on at once, which Trammell, maybe we just dive in right there. What, how the heck are you doing so much at once? <laughs> well, by not knowing any better, right? <laughs> by consistently biting off more than we can chew and uh, definition of insanity. Okay, all right. Good on you. Right. So tell us a little about what, what's going on with these different conferences and what's EarthX all about? Huh? It, uh, EarthX started as an expo for the public the very first year, uh, nine years ago around the time of Earth Day, we had a, a two-day festival with the exhibitors and uh, 40,000 people. I say exhibitors, and that means uh, the Sierra Club, uh, the University of Georgia, um, uh, 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 corporations, uh, little little companies that sell solar paneling to the public, uh, but mainly an educational thing for the general public to come see uh, become aware and, and learn more and Lord knows we all need to do that all over America, but mainly in Texas <laughs> um, and uh, uh, It has become very multifaceted at first we just showed it, you know, maybe a couple of movies a day Now there's a, a full-fledged film festival and, and last year. I think it was I think it was 69 virtual reality films uh, all about ecology so again, it was the largest um, uh, an investment forum with uh, startups and venture capital companies, but you say how did it happen? It's, it's we we just didn't go by the rule book, and when uh, corporations said they wanted to have a, a conference for corporate sustainability, we did. Uh, the, when we saw that Austin, Texas, has an amazing environmental super conference, they call it, of uh, hundreds of attorneys, we started one too. Uh, now we have an ocean conference uh, for scientists and foundations. Uh, uh, there will be the Global Youth Summit, mm -hmm. which we didn't mention. We didn't have this last year, but it will it will be in Dallas, and they're moving their headquarters to Dallas. Wow, uh, that's fabulous. Those 6,500 youth you, you were talking about, those were the organized school tours. There were tons more kids than, uh, wow. than that. So we, we did it by not knowing any better. Thank really, goodness. really remarkable. <laughs> Really remarkable. Right. You know, you just see all the excitement and and the activity. You know, yours translates into action, which is the key. Uh, we're trying. 
but if there's a conference that's just a lot of talk talk, yeah. don't worry about it. There's 170,000, 7,000 people who've never heard these things before. Right. So the awareness level is, oh, is an action item. Right. In my opinion, yes. the expo, just by uh, environmental groups showing what they do and, and kids and families walking by, that that's that's an action. Yeah. Yes. I wish this would happen in New York, yes. and if yes. it happened in Washington, D.C., the politicians might learn a little right. bit. Right, right. Well, that's a thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Earth X, D.C. Yeah, another, yeah. another target area. <laughs> well, you know, in Texas, and, and I mentioned to you I lived in San Antonio for a little while as a kid, you know, Texas is a... You lucky guy. It's a peculiar culture, right? It's a, it's a unique aspect of the American culture, and it's a very interesting place to be doing this kind of work, and I've... I've heard you talk a bit about the conservative niche, and I'm, I'm curious if you might expand yeah. on that a little bit. Yeah, a good example is, is when we first started this uh, nine years ago, we weren't sure how this was going to fly, because we want the public, uh, the business leadership, the political leadership. And so we started by not exhibiting all of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Directive Goals. If we did, uh, talk about all these wonderful things to save the world, it would have been branded as an overall uh, <coughs> left-leaning uh, event. Mm. And we that would have been the death knell of it. Mm. So we, st we have stuck straight to ecology, uh, so the exhibits and the, and the conferences concern themselves with soil, land, uh, air. Uh, we talk about climate change, but we also just talk about air pollution to the populace here, and they receive that message better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talk about uh, uh, wildlife conservation and animal habitat in many different ways, but one way you can do it here that you can't do in San Francisco is to talk about the benefits of hunting and fishing for wildlife conservation, responsible hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's been the mainstay of the deer population in America for decades. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's interesting with the Wine Earth community as we're doing community mobilization events all around the country, we're yeah. often working in very conservative communities. And what's really fun is we find that caring for land, caring for soil, caring for water, caring for the health and well-being of our families and loved mm -hmm. ones, it seems not to be a partisan issue. This seems to reach across yeah, all sectors of our, of our culture. Right. Yeah. Well, speaking of hunting, <laughs> uh, we know also up in Colorado that a whole lot of the land conservation happening there is the result of a well-managed hunting and fishing framework. And there's something interesting going on in Colorado right now, isn't there, that we were just talking about a bit yeah, ago? Last night, mm -hmm. when we were together, yes. yeah. uh, Laura Seidel of the, the Captain Planet Foundation and all the great things that the Turner and Seidel families do, was here talking to us about the wolf reintroduction program into Western Colorado, which you say 17 million acres, I think, uh, in Western Colorado, or public lands. And uh, I don't know when people first started shooting wolves, but the wolf cop population in America went from tens or hundreds of thousands down to a few hundred wolves. Mm -hmm. It's been restored in many places. Now in Colorado, uh, they want to reintroduce the wolves in the western part of the state. They have to change legislation to do that. They've got the funding, and part of it is because of uh, Turner and mm -hmm. Captain Planet Foundation. And the, the, you know, I don't remember the name of the, of the group that Mike Phillips runs. Right. The Rocky right. Mountain uh, Wolf Project. Wolf. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, so what's going on is in order to have this on the ballot, uh, they have to get 20,000 more signatures. Yeah. Yes. They need a total of 120,000 yeah. and they've got... 126,000. Yeah. yeah. 126,000 is they, the target. They got to have yeah. it by December 6th and I guess the way the way the world wo works is that's not so much a matter of saying you all go sign a petition because it's not online at this time, right? But of contributing uh, to this fund, going to this website, mm -hmm. and contributing uh, dollars so that the uh, the, the what you say twenty different organizations, bunches of organizations, 20, uh, right. thirty four groups, yeah, yeah. thirty four in Colorado, groups. yes, can get are part these of this twenty thousand more signatures, yeah, rapido. So this is interesting. So folks can go to rockymountainwolfproject.org 
to support the effort. And, and as we know, increasingly, there's a bunch of really beautiful documentaries on this and a lot of research showing how wolves are essential to the ecological well-being of Western landscapes, um, landscapes all over really, and especially Western Rocky Mountain landscapes. So be sure to check that out, rockymountainwolfproject.org, and support that effort. Uh, we've got uh, just a little over a month at the time of this recording, and ordinarily a little glimpse behind the scenes. We've got several recorded episodes um, between the time of recording and the time of publication, and this is one we'll probably accelerate because it's such a time-sensitive issue and get this out sooner than later uh, so that uh, folks hear about this in the month of November and can take action before that de deadline in early mm -hmm. December. And, you know, it's all about action trammel and it's all about uh, mobilizing, and I'm just, I'm absolutely struck and uh, it's so impressed by the way you're mobilizing folks all over and I'm, I'm really curious 2020 coming up it's a big year right tell, tell us yeah. why, why is it such an important year what's going to be happening uh, 2020 April 22 2020 is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day Earth Day maybe you youngsters out there don't know how important that was that was was, was the galvanizer of environmental movement and everything done before that was really called conservation and wasn't something that mm. pervaded our lives. And now, as, as you all know, it's drop by drop, uh, bit by bit, pick up a piece of plastic by a piece of plastic. Uh, so that's what kicked off in April 22, 1970. This coming April 22, uh, 2020 is the 50th anniversary there will be many, many people and organizations all over the country celebrating and doing other things. So uh, it'll be our 10th event. We will celebrate, so to speak, this 50th by April 22 in Dallas, having major figures from those eras. Um, I don't, we have, I don't, Mr. Ralph Nader has not said he's coming, but hey, Ralph, we, we want you to come. <laughs> You're invited. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, active people. Uh, and get Mrs. Nader. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, all right. If he doesn't, then he will. <laughs> but we do along those lines. Yeah. Senator Gaylord Nelson was the guy, the governor of Minnesota. I mean, Wisconsin, and the senator of Wisconsin, who said there shall be an Earth Day, and he said it in September of '69. But he called it a, 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 a teach-in mm. because that's what they did back then, right. the sit-ins and yes. the love-ins. Yeah. They called it, we're yeah. going to have a teach-in. <laughs> By the time it rolled around in April, it was called Earth, Earth Day. 10,000 high schools and other schools and 1,500 universities all participated in America. It was mainly a national event. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, what I have read is that there were more people there and all over the country, rather spontaneously, than any civil rights movement event or any anti-war movement event mm. in the world. Mm. Oh my God, mm. that was the environment. So yeah. that's how important Earth Day is. So Trammell, um, I imagine a few a few of our audience members uh, maybe weren't yet born uh, April 22nd, 1970. Where where were you? Just take us back a little. Paint a picture. What 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 was different then than now? What's the same? Um, what was that well, like? Some things were better and some things were worse. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, obviously, there wasn't the climate change problems yeah. at, at that time. Some had begun, but they were imperceptible. There, there weren't uh, ocean plastic problems. There weren't ocean acidification and coral reef dying problems. Uh, there, there were there was air pollution problem urban uh, primarily remember there was acid rain remember right. yeah. because of the uh, uh, sulfur emissions from coal fire plants right. and when rich when rivers started catching on fire mm -hmm. uh, and and death rates climbed because of air pollution the general public rose up and called out and uh, and and demanded to be heard. Uh, so, Congress and the, and the Senate and the White House were the, uh, the the governments that heard them, and at that time it was Richard Nixon 
So as a Republican, and we're mainly a Republican state here, uh, he formed the EPA and quickly passed various acts. I don't remember which one happened first, but the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, as a consequence of April 22, 1970, and through the 70s, Many legislations uh, were passed. Uh, what I, I guess I didn't did I say rivers started catching on fire. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Rivers catching fire. Uh, so that kind of thing stopped. And by the way, let me mention to those folks in Santa Barbara, California, who have told me, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, Trammel, 1969 was the first Earth Day." Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. They didn't have an Earth Day per se, but that big oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara then yes. Yes. was really one of the uh, single incidents right. that started the movement. Wow, wow. You know, we, uh, we recently had on the podcast um, Matt Gray, the Chief Sustainability Officer of the City of Cleveland, and he was talking mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. The, the, the history there with the river right in the city catching on fire. That's the Cuyahoga? Yep, yeah. yep exactly. We've got a big glare going on there, Joni, huh? That's yeah, okay. Oh, let's. Uh, can we just slide that bag over? Would that help a little? Sure. This is this is live coming at you, folks. This is the real world, and uh, we're having a real oh, conversation here. right here in Trammel's nature. Dallas, Texas, with uh, Trammel Crow. And um, so, Trammel, where where were you on that first Me. birthday? Yeah, where were you looking? I was in. Were you uh, swimming? <laughs> I was in Highland Park High School, right here in Dallas, Texas, and. Uh, I guess the, in 1969, the 60s hadn't quit quite hit Texas. Then, <laughs> okay, you know. Okay. And so uh, they were just waiting. I don't think that it was on my radar. I don't think I was even aware of it. Okay. I don't know where it occurred in Dallas, but it did. And there were a, a, a old hands that mm-hmm. were there, and in Austin. Uh, uh, so no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mm-hmm. at the original mm-hmm. high school. And Joni, do you remember where you were on the first Earth Day? Um, I was in Minnesota. Yeah. My family had moved from South Dakota to Minnesota. So we were just uh, at those schools and listening and learning. And But did you celebrate Earth Day on April 22? Yes. Oh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I did. Cool. I did. There might have been a little more awareness, you know, in Minnesota than in Texas. Well, and you know, you just love the outdoors as a kid. Mm-hmm. You just love the nature, and so mm-hmm. it just like Yogi Bear. <laughs> you know, that that brings up something that I think is part of what your organization works on. Uh, suburban sprawl, yeah. ironically, introduced city people yeah. to nature. That's right. Yeah. By you know, not just having yards, but uh, three doors down was the end of the of the of the neighborhood, and yeah. there were fields. Yeah, field green. We talked about that in New York. Absolutely. Yeah. And that right now, one of the things we can do in these suburban communities is mm-hmm. permaculture the heck yes. out of them and get the biodynamic soil activation going. It's great infrastructure actually for food forests. And so this is part of the work we're doing, promoting that in communities all over. Yeah, in one year you can turn around your whole soil. Mm -hmm. Zach Bush and his farmer's footprint and creating the research on glyphosate, creating cancer, you know, that we now have Roundup on the way out so we can now restore our soil and restore our Can you say that again now that we have Roundup out? Can you know what is this? Well, Dr. Zach Bush uh, is an amazing doctor who did much of much of the research on glyphosate, which is water soluble, went in um, through Roundup being applied. Roundup being the pesticide. Yep. Yes. By Monsanto. Yes. That people use in their lawns and farm fields. Everywhere. Yeah, throughout agriculture, yeah. throughout. So what has happened? Well, it was. It's been water soluble, and there's what has a whole happened to the use of it? Yes, and it has just destroyed the health of the people administering it thought, and our soil I and our water. I thought you were saying this. Has there been legislation now? So there's there's now a series of lawsuits arising yes. because of the science that Zach Bush has been leading on and okay. we're seeing increasingly commercial farmers switching back to organic farming practices knowing that not only is glyphosate poisoning food, 
it's also contributing to extraordinarily high rates of cancer in the farming communities. Yeah. So this is, it's, it's something we're all working on. And it's something your we're backyard, all part of. your own garden, yeah. if you yeah. used it, in your own backyard. Yeah. But no I good. thought I heard so. that there are some states where it's been banned. Not yet. That's interesting. I, I'm not sure where okay. we are on that. I, well, I thought I heard the way. last week. We're I thought I heard the way. last, yeah. last yeah. week. Yeah. That There's might a be huge trouble. momentum we'll to on it now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, let me, let me ask. We're talking a little about the history, thinking 50 years back. And I'm wondering, Trammell, for you, you know, here you are, you grew up in Texas uh, from a family in real estate and business. How, how did you get into the environmental and ecological work that you're now leading? Well, the original story was just real simple. There's no great romance to it. Uh -huh. My brother taught me three words when I was uh, 12. He probably taught me other three words. <laughs> yeah, but, I don't know if we should say that. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> but well, environment... Uh, 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 population and politics yeah. and as soon as I learned those words they became the most important things to me thank goodness environment population but, politics uh -huh. yeah got it I like to say and he proceeded to forget the first two because he, <laughs> he's not an uh, active environmentalist but uh, that's not fair um, but like many people I just went about my way and school and college and work and getting married and kids so I really wasn't fully active until uh, my um, 50s but I said finally I get to do what I want because I'm lucky enough to be able to work full-time in nonprofit most people cannot afford to do that uh, I guess the lesson there is don't wait until you're 50. <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah, don't Start don't now. retire. Yeah. You have yeah. to balance your life yes. with working on things you believe in as well as a vocation. You know, one of the one of the things that I talked about at length in the book Why on Earth is that uh, increasingly as our economy is transforming, as the marketplace is transforming, there are more and more careers, both for profit and non profit that are engaged in regenerative, in conservation-oriented, in, in restoration and sustainability-oriented business practices. And it's so exciting doing a lot of work with youth, knowing that they're, they're looking ahead to a future where there are all kinds of job opportunities yeah. that, that are doing great work for the world, for the environment, and for people. You can go work in a green job in a mm -hmm. plastics company. Yeah. Who would have yeah. thought? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh wait, what, wait, wait! A little yeah. while ago, you said something about forest food, food forests. Yes. Yeah, food forests. Yes. What, what? Yes. So this is this is mimicking some of the natural stacking of layers of tall trees, medium height trees, shorter trees, shrubs, etc., all uh, producing different types of foods, nuts, fruits, etc. Mm -hmm. It's a perennial strategy related to permaculture to get more diversity in food production in our homes, our gardens, our yards, which also has a wonderful side benefit of creating more habitat for pollinators, for important insects. So are you saying it's a matter of where you plant the trees and where you plant the underbrush? Or? Yes, and different yeah. types of trees, right, to right. grow the nuts and the fruits that are climate appropriate. So what, what you might see in a food forest here in mm -hmm. Dallas is probably gonna be different than what we would see up in Cleveland in terms of species selection. Where would I see a food forest? In Dallas, we gotta find one. We, we we'll just did a, a fabulous tour of a right. of a of an evangelical preacher's 3.7 acre permaculture food forest with his family and his kids. Yeah. We did a soil activation. This was up in yeah. Ohio, oh, out, oh, okay. outside yeah. Akron. Yeah. And it's a it's an episode that'll be published fairly North soon. North Texas. And North Texas, <laughs> up there in Ohio. But uh, it would be really cool before uh, EarthX in April to identify a food forest here that we could do right. an episode at and mm -hmm. yes. film and learn and tell people about it for yes. sure. Yes, this can spread like, you know, the Garden of Eden. There, there are food forests in cities and in suburbs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. they're created by individuals and, and nonprofits. Right. Yes. In, in Cleveland, for example, there's an effort working with communities of refugees and immigrants to help take care of food forests getting established on vacant lots 
so that this is actually helping the city's management. Oh, 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 oh you could go to a half quarter acre right. and do a food yes. forest. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure you're thinking about this in terms of Texas food forest. Yeah. Well, yeah, 100 I acres. Big. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that too. And that gets into the whole Silva pasture uh, set of strategies that is being mobilized at larger scales where you're, you're doing a similar kind of strategy of having uh, different heights of trees producing nuts and fruits and also doing your livestock grazing underneath that which is a strategy for soil building which we know is one of the keys to sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. Let, 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 me, let me see here. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's, oh, look at that. Of that here. There's yes. a little touch of that. Yes. <laughs> it's a very short version <laughs> travel. By him. Where'd you get that? Soil Stewardship Handbook. Yeah. yeah. yeah you have a monstrous book. That, that's uh, why on yes. earth. Yeah, that thing. That thing's heavy. Oh, so, uh, well, we, do you remember where you wrote about it here? <laughs> so, uh, you know, in terms of Silva pasture and whatnot, it's. Let's see what's in here. This is so brief and so soil focused. Uh -huh. It may not be talking about food forests actually. So, so it's all soil stewardship. This is all soil focused. And I got a funny quick story on this. One of my old buddies I grew up with played football and baseball with. He called me after I sent him a copy of Why on Earth, and it was about Christmas time. And his name's Joe, and he, he called me up, and he and he said, uh, he said, Aaron, can't you just boil this all down and tell me what to do? <laughs> and I said, Joe, have I got the thing for you. We're gonna in a couple months have our soil stewardship handbook out, which is just full of activities people can do. You in sent him the four hundred dollars, the four four hundred page. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was Why exactly. on Earth, yeah. the Bible. Yeah. We but no, we, we could be doing more uh, resources on the food forest strategies, and I think it's a yes. really important angle. One of the others that we're starting to produce some content for is what homeowners associations can be doing to stop oh. toxifying, oh. Yes. to start building yes. soil, to do, do you have make it so edible kind of, landscapes. Uh, a yes. manual for that? That's or? cooking. That's right. cooking. It's How coming. far off is it? Well, it's probably just a few weeks before we have a very short document, and then probably about... Uh -huh. A handful of months before we have something a little longer. Uh, speaking of the biggest, yes, yes. Okay, I believe <laughs> that the biggest homeowner association management company. Yeah. I think they've got eight thousand HMOs. Wow. Know, what do we call it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I forget. Wow. It might be fifty. It might be twenty thousand by right. now. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. John Corona here in Dallas, who exhibits at our event. Oh, very cool. Uh, you send me that at the beginning stage that and I'll, I'll send it to him. That'd be great. Yeah, That'd be great maybe girl. he could get started learning. Yeah, you know, this is the kind of thing wherever we are, whether it's a big urban environment like New York City, whether it's suburban, whether it's rural, there's so much we can all be doing. And what I love about EarthX is it's so packed full of solutions, of information about things going on worldwide, and of ways people are mobilizing in communities all over. Okay, so we build apartments, mm -hmm. Trammell Crow Company, mm -hmm. residential. Mm -hmm. uh, what would a, a regular garden office, a, a garden apartment complex, three-story apartment, yeah. and your, your occasional swimming pool, whatnot, what would the, the uh, property manager and the residents do there? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, one of the strategies is to put in community gardens so that the individuals have access to growing a little bit of their own fresh vegetables or what have you, which also creates community. It also uh -huh. uh, reduces often uh, crime in some cases where you've got more community uh -huh. interaction, more eyes watching the streets, so to yeah, speak. Yeah. You can also do the food forest strategies so that your landscape's not just for the visual aesthetic, mm -hmm but is also growing foods and in some cases medicinal herbs. Now, right. now a key is when we're doing food and medicinal herbs, we don't want any poisons there. So part of, part of this shifting in mentality and philosophy and psychology is, hey, we're not gonna spray poisons to make sure that there's no blade of grass sticking yeah. up between the concrete or what have you. And we're gonna stop toxifying our environments. We're also gonna really encourage people to do composting which is soil building as opposed <coughs> to methane producing because when those um, when those food wastes and and waste paper and all that goes to landfill we're just exacerbating the climate crisis so as a real estate a residential developer mm -hmm. yeah what would i do to learn about com offering composting to 
tenants. Well, golly, I guess we got to produce some resources for you. Yeah. And, I, and a whole lot like you. Yeah, that, I think I think it's a big opportunity. But wait, but you might have to get to know your neighbors. <laughs> well, right. That's that's the. <laughs> and what they eat. <laughs> yeah. Look, look. And what they eat. Yeah. And what they. And, and I think I think a lot of us would agree that in our country right now we've got a real cultural crisis and we've got a real divisiveness out there that we can heal. Well, part and, of the reason is because we don't know our neighbors. You know, part yeah. of it is, and I love, there's, a quote, there's a quote like from that. President Franklin Roosevelt. He said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And I imagine there's got to be a corollary there, which is a nation that heals its soil heals itself. And it could be that as our communities are mobilizing around these soil installations, gardening, food for us that mm -hmm. also means we're healing our communities well you wrote that quote down i need that i need to yeah. use that i'll yeah. give that to you yeah oh, absolutely yeah well i love well, well, hang on hang on oh, I, I, I got some more questions for yeah. you okay. <laughs> you were <excited. laughs> this is fun. also you know when that's when you met at at our day you yeah. met jerome who did the um he's our permaculture guru there that wrote the book on the greenhouses. Jerome Ostenkowski. Yeah. Ostenkowski, of course. A yeah. Book, yeah. And if not, I'll get you one. But that's a real um, important piece for developers Would to Would you have send too. it to us? I will. Okay. I will. So, so again, as a developer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, uh, residential apartments, the gardens you said, yeah. the composting you said. Yeah. Uh, what about just a, a regular office building? I don't mean well, a 50-story building. Check this out. I think we've got a huge opportunity here. I think that we know through the research that indoor air quality in office buildings yeah. is particularly bad because we've got a lot of materials off-gassing. Computers, finishes, paints, furniture, all kinds of things, carpets. Yeah. And we also know, get this, that certain species of plant are very, very good at filtering air, carcinogens in particular, the very mm -hmm. best is the spider plant is the household name. We can get the Latin name for you. And uh, in fact, on our soil stewardship webinar, which is available on the website, we talked about this. One of the things I think we'll be seeing in the coming years inside of office buildings is a whole bunch of living plants, spider plants and others that are particularly good at filtering the air. I hope we see this in people's homes too. We know childhood asthma is closely related to indoor air quality issues. And that means you're necessarily also bringing in soil. So think about one of the ways we can sequester carbon and in, make these urban rural linkages is by having these soil installations with living plants and uh, helping to educate and connect the dots for people about how these things are all interrelated. So, so we need to recruit uh, individuals or companies that want to come to EarthX and sell those types of plants to mm -hmm. the public. And, and yeah, yeah, that. that'd be great. And design, uh, so you have the daylight <coughs> and better design standards so that you have yeah. green building in, in your design. Well, that, that's easier, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. that's, that's happening. Yeah. We're, we're starting to do that in, in, res, in residential and then the office buildings are really going that way yeah. towards yeah. leads and all. Yeah. 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 But to have the plants in the space doing yes. that work is yes. essential. Yeah. We, we've evolved to live among and within living plants and trees and forests. And we know there's a ton of research from the medical and psychological community. Plants for five minutes measurably reduces yeah. stress hormones. We know it's related to cognitive performance. We know it's related to quality of life. We know it's related to creativity and some of these things we need in our businesses and our workplaces. So it's, to me, almost a no-brainer in a sense, and I think there's probably a lot of commercial opportunities as we mobilize these kinds of strategies. And it means we're all healthier in the end and hopefully doing even more stewardship and regenerative work, whether it's in real estate or some other industry, we all get to help shape and create the future together. One of the Earth Xlings, one of us <laughs> at Earth X, uh, Bruce, has some device that detects the carbon footprint where he is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he says in, in his office, his particular office, it's 1,000 uh, parts per million. Mm. 
And that doesn't sound good, but he says again, that's not unusual at all. A thousand partners per million. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wait till Dr. That's Oz right. finds out about this. <laughs> and outdoors is what, 410 right. or something? Yeah. Right, yeah. and just by yeah. way of reference for folks who may not know this right offhand, before the Industrial Revolution, the carbon concentration in the atmosphere was 280 parts per million. So now, as Trammell's saying, we're, we're over 400 parts per million. It's we, bad. That's we, bad. We've seen over 43% increase yeah. in carbon concentration in the atmosphere. This is driving the climate crisis. What's beautiful about soil building is a 10% increase in soil carbon uh, is the equivalent of uh sequestering all of the fossil carbon we've released since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Say that again. 10% increase in soil carbon worldwide is equivalent to sequestering all of the fossil carbon we've released. So since I have a garden, how do I do this? Yeah, so we can get biodynamics going yeah. in, in the property. There are certain plants we can grow that are fast growing that are literally breathing in carbon from atmosphere and there are things we can do to them including composting some cases biochar mm. uh, to lock that carbon back in the ground where mm. it belongs we like to say and uh, can, can, can you to be. yeah can yeah. you off the top of your head say what trees here in texas not our native trees but what trees we know we know plant in my backyard yeah we know we know bamboo and hemp are pretty fast growing in this area um uh you got fast growing poplar um there, with with you've got a really beautiful forest here. I'm just looking out the windows, and uh, even here at the lower level of the landscape, you could be doing a lot of comfrey, mm -hmm. which every uh, fall you would then compost. It's a very fast growing. You know, it only gets a couple few feet high, although it, it can get, you know, three four feet high sometimes. Yeah, mine's this high in New York. Uh, it's a grass. It's a comfrey. No, it's, it's a, a leafy plant. leafy it's a plant. Leafy plant. Yeah. That's also very healthy for healing wounds and things like yeah, that. Yeah, it's but it's great for the soil, and it's hmm. beautiful everywhere. You could have it everywhere. Yeah, when I travel around the country and visit different properties, one of the ways I can identify that there's a permaculturist involved. <laughs> yes. that there's a bunch of <laughs> Where's your growing. comfrey? Huh. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, 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 bamboo. Uh, it's not necessarily a species specific. Just most bamboo is does, is good for this. That's a great question. I don't know uh -huh. the answer to that, it, so it'd be good to figure out which one. If it weren't, you probably growing. you probably know. Uh, okay, we got a lot of bamboo. And this is the other thing with the built environment. When we're developing new buildings, when we build with wood and bamboo, that's effectively locking atmospheric carbon up for a very long time. So when we're thinking about material selections, even for finishes and so forth, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to get back to some of these more natural materials that are ways to sequester carbon, basically. Oh, so they, they store the carbon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And bamboo, their leaves are so good for so many things, teas and medicines and facials. <laughs> I don't think we've ever taken our bamboo leaves. No kidding. Uh, no. Um, yeah, you've got a beautiful Okay, hemp. Order. We have not planted hemp trees here, and we should. Yeah, the hemp's yeah. a, uh, real, a really important so strategy. Some states it's illegal, some it's not. Mm -hmm. What is the status here in Texas right now? It was just legalized last year, I think. Okay, yeah. And it's a, it's got amazing medicinal benefits as well, uh, the hemp plant. And increasingly, I think we're going to see an incredible mobilization around uh, uses of the fibers for things like clothing. And there's some infrastructure that needs to be developed around the country for that. Mm -hmm. You know, what's amazing is this nation is really founded on hemp agriculture. We have towns uh, George called Washington Hempstead all over the place. Yeah, uh -huh. Hempstead and so on. And and what do you mean Hempstead? Well, there are, there are lots of towns and villages with the name Hempstead, Hempstead. in the United States. Oh, and, oh I didn't uh, realize You know, that. it's part of our heritage, it sure. really is. And it's a very, it's a special plant. Uh, the history as to why it became so demonized and uh, Just because polarized it's associated and, with marijuana. That's right. It's not, it, yep. uh, yep. doesn't have the active drug, but no, right. it's demonized. Yeah, it has been, and that's one of the things we need to do a lot more of uh, growing a lot more hemp for uh, new materials and for transitioning off of uh, fossil uh, plastics and so forth and uh, it really can help the landscape and in a lot of the agricultural regions of our country it's helping the economics of the farmers also which is which is just tremendous to see that starting to kick in yeah because farmers have the highest suicide rate of any occupation even in America even in America not just yeah. India and part of it is because 
Well, that's a well, whole other time. podcast, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, when you can't. Uh, when you're monocropping, you can't have healthy soils. You know, you, it takes the permaculture aspect to farming. And then when you have to put toxins in it constantly, constantly, constantly. Farmers, I'm a farmer. I love my land. And you feel it when you're putting that in, when you have to farm when government policy that's been set up the way it has. By big of, business. Yeah, by big business. That's... You know, same thing with the food industry. That's why people get sicker now, because we don't have healthy food. It's, you know, it's shelf life, designed for shelf life and not human life. But we're changing that bit by bit. Yeah. Bite by bite. Bite by bite, mm-hmm. bit yeah. by bit. Well, let me, let me just remind our audience that this is the Why on Earth Communities Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series. And today we're having a wonderful conversation with Trammell Crow in his home here in Dallas, Texas. And I'm joined by Joni Clark, one of our board members. And um, I want to do a quick shout out to our partners and sponsors who are making this possible, um, as well as making our community mobilization work all around the country and internationally possible. So these organizations include Patagonia, Earth Coast Productions, Waylay Waters, the Lidge Family Foundation, the International Society of Sustainability Professionals, Beauty Counter, Purium, and Madeira Outdoor. I also want to give a special thanks to all the individuals out there who have joined our monthly giving program. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you haven't yet joined and you'd like to, you can go to whyonearth.org, hit the donate button, or go to whyonearth.org support and select any level on a monthly basis that you'd like to contribute to this work. And when you do so, when you join, I'll send you an email with a very special code that will allow you to unlock all of our ebook and audiobook resources for free. And you can share that with friends and family. So it's a really wonderful win-win. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm loving that we're talking here, Trammell, about soil, about taking care of our planet, about the outdoors and so on, and some of the connections we can make to the built environment. And I'm looking around your beautiful home here and I'm seeing so many different uh, rocks, special rocks and minerals and gems. And I see a bunch of malachite sitting over there and it's clear that you have a real well, affinity for Let's, for let's, some of let's rocks. show them. Yeah. So talk yes. to us about this. Oh, What's going on here? You know, I, don't, I don't know. That, yeah, I'm not, I'm it not looks like a tiger's eye almost. Uh, it might be related because there's, yeah. there's tiger eye. Oh, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. 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 You, you, I can tell you're dying to hold it. Uh, yeah, I mean so the what, power of yeah, yeah. I'm just, I just enjoy yes. having them and the, and the beauty of them. Mm. Yeah. But do you want to go get the the, the malachite? malachite? I'll go grab some. I'll grab some real quick. <laughs> sure. Yes. But just the feel of this and the beauty of it all, and the magic yeah. and the history yeah. behind it, and all the power it has, all the magic. You know. Stone shaman, it's kind of on its own. Gosh, you know, several people last night were talking about the Tucson Gym and Mineral Show. Yeah. A lot of rock hands. Yeah. This one's yeah, beautiful. Yes. That is. Beautiful yeah. malachite, which has a lot of copper in it. I guess that's part Hence of the how, green. Yep. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Yeah. So that's you got a you got a connection with the the stones and the rocks. Is that right? Stone I just people. like them. I just <laughs> like them. Yeah. Yeah. They speak to you. Buy me and bring me yeah. home. <laughs> I don't know what, what, but I've never read any real science on, on crystal power, you know, mm. uh, but a lot of people seem to believe so. Yeah, when I encounter folks who are super skeptical, skeptical about crystals, I remind them, you know, the first radios that we used had quartz crystal in them, and it was the oscillating frequency of the quartz crystal that somehow allowed for this communication through the ethers or the airwaves or what have you so it's kind of interesting there's a lot more going on on this but, planet uh, radio waves mm-hmm. are attracted to crystal well i don't know exactly the mechanism but uh-huh. the first radios had quartz crystal in them it was part of the mm-hmm. the way the devices were communicating yeah, we don't have to the use those anymore right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah they all made each other happy <laughs> But, you know, I'm, I'm really excited, Trammell, about the opportunity we've had to visit with you today and really excited about the uh, 50th anniversary of Earth Day, the 10th anniversary of Earth X. 
2020 in April. Don't miss it. Uh, go to earthx.org to get more information, to get involved. There's all kinds of resources on there, huh? Yeah, I can't say what they're all is, but there's lots, lots. of good stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. Volunteer opportunities, links to other uh, organizations. Uh, and then back to the wolf thing, mm -hmm. also April 24, 25, and 26 next year, there will be the wolf introduction program exhibiting at the event and people speaking about it. And we're going to get an ornery Texas rancher. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. Who doesn't like it a single bit. Uh -huh. And bring him in and have a debate okay. yes. on good. the pros and cons. Fantastic. That'll be good. Yeah. Hopefully that'll be filmed. Yeah. That'll be really good. We got lots of them. We, we, need, we, we need more of that kind of debate. You can do a whole series. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, before before we wrap up, uh, Joni, I just I want to give you an opportunity if you have any closing thoughts or remarks for Trammell or for the audience. Well, I just uh, want to thank Trammell first of all because you've been so gracious as you are with all of us, Please. you know, and um, your passion and your commitment and the beauty with which you do it and the humor and the spirit is just <laughs> and the orneriness <laughs> uh, we hope our whole team helps bring them together but it is these thousand of, of conferees scientists mm -hmm. uh, uh, exhibitors right. yes. uh, participants who make it all happen you know well the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree <laughs> okay that's what I see here with the marvelous people surrounding you because it's like being magnetized to the fullness of life in this way. Thank you. Well, and Trammell, if, uh, if you would share any final thoughts, calls to action, words of wisdom with our no, audience. I don't, have to. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything on the tip of my tongue. Uh, 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 don't shop, do vote. How's that? That's pretty hey. beautiful. It's concise. Well, thank you so much, Trammell. It's great being thank with you Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Be seeing you soon. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code WHYONEARTH, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.